All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> Well, hello and welcome to the Actual Anarchy Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian and anarcho-capitalist perspective. And tonight, we're going to be doing a little bit of the Mad Max action. Uh, we're going to talk about the 1979 film and possibly some of the additional ones. We did do Fury Road a couple of years ago, but uh, we want to start on the original movie tonight, and it should be a lot of fun. We're going to actually be having our guest from Australia uh, who's been on now 11 times. This is his 11th episode with us, uh, but it's 10th movie because we did Dark Knight, I think, over two episodes. But anyway, you can find the show notes more for this at actualanarchy.com slash 217. And before we head on down to Australia to meet our friend, let's uh, check in with Robert and see how things are going with your mask mandates and your uh, restauranteering, sir. Hey, diddly do, Daniel, and everybody else. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I'm always happy to be here. Um... Yeah, I would like to know or I'd like to be able to report that everything's back to normal, but that is not the case. Um, yeah, can't don't really have a whole lot to report. Uh, the supposedly we're being allowed to have limited dine in starting this next week, uh, maybe even starting tomorrow. I'm not sure, but it's you according to the um. The landlords at the place we rent, they are very worried about us, you know, following the letter of the government mandate on any of the things, regardless of whether it makes sense, regardless of how expensive it is to implement, regardless if it's, if it's just a bunch of security theater. It's just you have to follow these done ass rules and, you know, it's just bureaucracy at its finest. It doesn't make any sense. But you got to do it anyway because you don't own the place. So it's good, fun, lots of fun. All the more, all the more reason for us to get our own, get our own place. Right. If you find and, yourself and then, not liking the rules. Yeah, get your own place. Yeah, build your own Twitter, build your own social media network, or uh, get your own place. But you'll soon find that you actually own it in name only, right? Because they're still going to dictate what you can do, when and where, and how much and uh, how much you need to pay uh, extra and what regulations you need to follow to make it more and more uh, inefficient to stay in business. It's the way of the bureaucracy. Well, I do love that it's always rules for thee and not for me, right? You know how, like, what was it? Parlor and whatever was kicked off of Amazon. They didn't want to associate with Amazon, which fine, but it was because they had, they didn't do enough to, quote, you know, get rid of or remove like what uh, incitement posts or whatever. And yet that stuff is allowed to run rampant on Twitter or Facebook as long as you're on the left, as long as you're inciting like riots for, you know, George Floyd or any other reason, you're totally fine. But if you are, I don't know, on the right for any reason at all, then you are doing it for the wrong reasons and you are a Nazi and we need to shut you down. It's, you know, it's the ultimate hypocrisy, but it does, it does create, I think a hardier person. It creates a more resilient, it creates a more hmm, resourceful person, right? Cause you can't, you can't trust. I mean, you're, you're, you're having strange bedfellows when you're high buying uh, server space from these progressive lefties you're, you're you know you're working on borrowed time here <laughs> so yeah uh you know find find somebody who is more open to the ideas of free speech it just seems like a smarter business move to do 
even if it costs a little bit more. Maybe if Amazon's the cheapest web hosting service around, uh, you might have to pay a little bit more to go to a smaller one. But that smaller one's not going to kick you off thinking that you're a Nazi. Just an idea. You can follow it. You don't have to follow it. I'm not saying I like it. I'm not saying I like it when people kick other people off for their political ideas and whatever and are, are blatant hypocrites about it. But, you know, I'm all for secession and voluntary association. So it's all the more incentive to just disassociate with people. Uh, I know for me, even though I love Amazon, I love all the services they provide, the efficiency and the, the, the cheapness that they can get goods to people and the speed with which they can get goods to people. I was disgusted by them kicking off the parlor. And I find myself wanting to use their services less. I mean, it does have effects. They do have negative effects, even if they are the biggest. It's not necessarily going to hurt them too much. But if they continue this kind of crap, maybe it will. Maybe right. It, it just, reminds me of my my uh, canceling of Netflix and how that must have hurt them so square in the pocketbook that they care really hard that I, I canceled their service. But, They're still uh, complaining about it. They are still, you go on Twitter, you go to the official Netflix Twitter, and it's still talking about how you canceled your service. They are really butthurt about it. Totally heard about it. But, you know, uh, I think there is a silver lining, like you were saying, because as people have been um, basically shown the blatant hypocrisy and how unsafe their content is and their social media profiles are on these um, progressively owned uh infrastructure then they have to kind of check where they're at and and homestead new areas uh, our buddy pat mcfarland of liberty weekly he wrote a nice little article about it and he considered this golden age of um, social media that this is going to be finally what's going to be the tipping point to move enough people off of the traditional platforms into new areas and have a proliferation so that they're going to you know, have their own little echo chambers left over, but it's going to be kind of a shell of its former self. And uh, we're going to have a, 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 an abundance of opportunities that are presented from this. So I think it's really good. I'll post that on our show notes page. And uh, you can find his work at libertyweekly.net. He's a really good guy. And uh, we like him a lot. So anyway, any final moments or final comments, Robert, before we get into the last nighters and introduce our guest? No, this is going to be a big one. Even though I only saw... The original Mad Max, and I know we went on to talk about the entire kind of series a little bit. I was only contractually obligated to watch the very first one, so that's all I did. But that being said, I am a huge fan of Fury Road, and I've seen the movie probably at least three times, maybe more than that. Maybe, you know, I've, I've watched it intently two or three times, and then I probably put it on in the background a couple of times. So that kind of counts as like three or four times. All right. So I, I, yes, I, I realize that. Witness, witness. But um, yeah, I think I feel pretty confident about my ability to discuss this series in in its in its whole. So I, I'm welcoming your guys's comments and your ideas, and I think this will be a good one. All right, I agree, and we will witness this in just a moment after the last nighters intro music. Everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Paul Johnson. We are the Last Nighters. You can find us on the last or lastnighters.com and also on the Liberty Movement's YouTube channel, which we will have on our show notes page at lastnighters.com slash 160 as we're talking about the movie Mad Max. So we're heading down to uh, Adelaide to talk to our friend Shaheen, who is actually from uh, Australia, obviously, uh, and as is uh, Mel Gibson and the Mad Max franchise started there. So this will be a lot of fun. And again, you can find the show notes more at lastnighter.com. So it's 160. Uh, Shaheen has been on our show 11 times now. This is time number 11, uh, but the 10th movie. Uh, we did Die Hard with you and then a bunch of DC and Batman stuff. And uh, we do have you slated to come back, um, I think, in April to do the, the Zack Snyder cut of uh, Justice League. So that should be awesome. I'm looking forward to that. I hear it's going to be a four or five hour uh, yeah, multi-part movie. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be four hours, yeah. 
And I think it was meant to be like a mini series, but they're making it a movie again. So yeah, should be good. Anything's better than the 2017 shit. I mean, we did an episode on that, right? The yes, Justice we League. did. Yeah, we crapped all over that. I did actually watch it fully for that. I remember I just like skipped through it because I, I could not bear the the torture of like I already know the movie, so I didn't really need to sit through the whole two hours. I kind of just skimmed through. I'm like, okay, that that tortures the tortures me, but yeah, right. And we also did. Done. We also did Batman v Superman, the Snyder mm. Cut version of that, which uh, I ended Three up watching one. both of them. And yeah, the Snyder Cut version definitely is an upgrade. Because it, it has I think these, I think you said pieces. you went from a five or a six to an eight, and I went from like a three or a four to a six after our analysis. That was your um your uh what was it? your ratings. So that's what I want: higher ratings for BVS. <laughs> it didn't get any worse. So it yeah, was. yeah, and it did make a lot more sense. Worse. It made a lot more sense with the stuff that uh, Snyder put back in. So no. I think that helped. And, and I'm really looking forward to what, what they do with uh, with the new Snyder cut. I, saying, I think Warner Brothers is just kind of retarded with, with what they do with the films. They just cut so much out. Well, I have to yeah. say the Steppenwolf looks way better. I don't know if you guys I have know. seen the, the promo yeah, images yeah. of Steppenwolf. He looked he like, like a grainy, spiky blurry, gray guy. And now he looks like this golden, spiky, spiky god creature. He looks Big awesome. Spiky fuck. Yeah. Yeah. No, he looks, looks so much better. Good. Like they really took their time and made this thing look good. So apparently, a lot of the scenes that, a lot of the scenes that have to do with the alien stuff that Warner Brothers deemed too scary are going to be put back in the film now. So a lot of like the murder scenes, cutting people in half, like, you know, the parademons, the, the henchmen that Steppenwolf has, like how they're made from humans, like the breeding pods and stuff, they're all going to be explored. So mm -hmm. it's going to be maybe an R rating. I don't know. It's, it's going to be good. And apparently Batman drops the F-bomb, so that's going to be nice. Nice. Holy Batman. So was there a lot of, um, was there a lot of reshoots for this? Or is this all um, taken from original footage? So in 2016, Zach, like after BVS, Zach, Zach shot everything. And then that was all just sitting there. They had a five-hour assembly cut. And um, now he's using about four hours of that, plus an extra like five minutes of additional photography just to get a few more scenes with, I think, Jared Leto's Joker and, you know, remember Swanwick, the Harry Lennox character? Mm -mm. It's, it's them back. All right. He's actually Martian Manhunter. Yeah. Oh, right. MM. Nice. Yeah, no. It's, it's going to be good. All right. Sounds good. Well, we're going to have uh, you back in April for that. And uh, we'll have a, a listing of all your prior appearances on the show notes page for this one, of course. Sounds um, good to me. And uh, yeah, how we usually start this off is with the old Google description. So here we go Mad Max. Came out 1979 action adventure film, one hour and 35 minutes. 6.9 on that IMDb, 90% Rotten Tomatoes, 73% Metacritic, and 87% of Google users like it. The description reads, in a not-too-distant dystopian future, when man's most precious resource, oil, has been depleted and the world plunged into war, famine, and financial chaos, the last vestiges of the law in Australia attempt to restrain a vicious biker gang. Max, played by Mel Gibson, an officer with the main force patrol launches a personal vendetta against the gang when his wife, uh, Joanne Samuel, and son are hunted down and murdered, leaving him with nothing but the instincts for survival and retribution. Release date, February 15, 1980. Director, George Miller. Budget, $350 million, uh, which I guess is a, is pretty low budget. Uh, and it did thousand. exceptionally what? well. Yeah, no, that's not million dollars. There's no way that's $350 million dollar movie. <laughs> Right, so so uh, of course has Mel Gibson and uh, started a whole franchise uh, out of this. So I, th I think this is one of those movies that did a lot better than they were expecting, and so they tacked on additional content uh, on the back end of it to kind of like fit it into uh, a whole new universe of. Um... This is where we plug the Patreon. Yeah, yeah, let's plug the Patreon. Content. Hell yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, our Patreon is uh, lessoners.com slash Patreon, and we are going to be probably moving that. I, I know I've threatened this in the past. I'm probably going to be moving that to like Subscribestar or Buy Me a Coffee or some other means of supporting us because um, as we were talking in some of the pre-show bonus content uh, with Robert here, um, the social media companies are not uh, being too kind to anything outside of the cathedral's narrative. Uh, so our days are numbered on these platforms as it is. I think that we're actually relatively tame, but um, I don't think that is. I, I saw a meme that's like, it's like five people or six or seven people. And this guy in the middle is like, oh, we just need to get rid of the extremists. And so they get rid of the person on the far end. And then the next panel down, now there's just six people. Now we need to get rid of the extremists. And it goes on and on until it's just that person who was in the middle. And they're like the the extent of that um, safe amount of content. You know, like everyone to the right of that person has been uh, deplatformed and, and uh, removed from the public square, so to speak. Yes. Yes. So yeah, maybe we will do that at some point. But we're not we're not we're not at that point yet. I mean, I think we're still fairly small, so we're flying under the radar, so to speak. But any time they could they could throw down the band hammer. You never know. That's right. We just say the one wrong thing, and who knows what it, who knows what it'll be. In fact, I've told my wife many times. I am so, um, I guess, advanced in my distrust of all things mainstream that I don't even know when I'm being um, conspiratorial sounding to a normie. Like I don't know where that line is anymore. It's totally lost on me. Like I, I, I couldn't tell you when I said something that is maybe over the line anymore. No idea. Yeah. Well, you never know what's the new offensive thing. So, and that changes constantly. So. All right. Well, why don't you offend you me? Live your life. Offend me with your opening salvo here, toe cutter. Okay. So yeah, Mad Max. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, you were talking about with in the description there. You, I didn't really get a, you get the sense that everything's poor and a little bit haphazard and kind of junky, but I didn't get the post-apocalyptic setting with post oil. And, you know, it's, I mean, I kind of understood the, the whole, you get the feel that they're kind of trying to hold society together with this ragtag band of cops, but uh, it, it more just seemed like, you know, there's a motorcycle gang and there's some cops and the motorcycle gang doesn't really have any kind of motivations other than that they're complete assholes and they don't like anybody standing up to them. So they're just like the classic 80s bully characters where they can just run around and be complete douchebags to everybody. And for seemingly absolutely no reason other than to just be complete douchebags. Like they are getting nothing out of it other than to just be complete hooligans running around, throwing their weight around, scaring people. And it's a minimalistic approach. Like George Miller, what I really liked about his storytelling in Fury Road seems like this is the infant version of it which makes sense right like i mean he's way younger this is what 20 some odd 30 30 some odd years earlier when he's making this film and it's just his like early ideas and he's kind of figuring out how to tell a story the movie feels like it was written down in pencil and kind of figured out as they went it very much feels improvised. A lot of the script, a lot of the dialogue feels improvised. There isn't a whole lot of dialogue. Um, the scenes, a lot of the scenes are very kind of like half formed. Like they don't really advance the plot. Some do, some don't. Uh, it, But it still has that stripped down feel of, look, this is a basic story. And we're just gonna tell it as best we can. And it works really, really well in Fury Road when he's got all the production value, all the movie making skills, 
and it works less good in you know with with one hundredth of the budget and one tenth of the movie making knowledge and the skills. But you know, it's still you you still get a sense that it's a it's a, a fun movie. It's an engaging movie. Um, towards the end, I felt a lot of good tension, like when the the wife character is running around, uh, putting herself in danger, basically unwittingly putting herself in danger. Um, I felt a lot of good tension. I was still mad that the characters are doing kind of dumb things. Like it kind of follows the classic horror tropes of never be armed, always split up and put yourself in vulnerable situations at all times. They don't do anything smart, but it's still a lot of fun. Uh, and I really do enjoy it. And I can see why it spawned so many sequels and launched uh, George Miller's career. And I'm so glad he went on to make Fury Road and, I guess he's making the Furiosa movie and then a sequel to Fury Road. So I'm excited where he's going to go. I'm not expecting some amazing script, but I am expecting just incredible jaw dropping action, which I thought Fury Road was. I thought Fury Road was the best action movie of 2000, the 2010s, that entire decade. Uh, I don't think anything else even comes close. So uh, he'll probably set the standard for the 2020s uh, and hopefully he'll make uh, movies for a long time to come. So I don't know. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen uh, the road warrior and Thunderdome. So I can't talk about like his progression as a filmmaker. I think I did see babe two and I thought that was, you know, competently done and whatnot, but I can't really talk about, you know, the progression of like ideas per se, or just like the, the skill of crafting a film and how it's progressed over the years. But I do know that he started off like a guy with a lot of passion and a few ideas and he ended up in a really good spot. So right on, good on ya, George Miller. I appreciate your work. Thanks a lot, buddy. Right, and th this was also a film that launched Mel Gibson as a, as a star, really. And then mm -hmm. uh, I think Road Warrior kind of cemented that. So uh, you can definitely see in in this movie, the the first one, Mad Max, the the star power that Mel Gibson has. I mean, he's super young looking and thin and and all that, but you can definitely tell that uh, he's got something, some kind of je ne sais quoi, and it played out and made him a big star for a long time after that. But I, I think you make a lot of good points. Um, I felt like the first movie here was just a lot of like, okay, we're going to have this sort of rough plot, like you were saying, sort of sketched out and have a couple of, you know, stunt scenes with practical effects. And we're just going to kind of have fun with it, kind of make this exploitation style, you know, crash them up kind of movie and, and have this loose plot sort of try to hold it together. I don't think they're very successful in that. It's more of a, um, it gives a feel, you know, and, and I think that's what kind of, took off in the cultural scene like this is a movie and a franchise that you don't even have to have seen to know about it and to know when people are referring to it in common you know common parlance you know like dystopian future mad max style i remember when the when the uh the pandemic came out everyone thought uh there was this meme that was passing around like oh i thought that uh when the apocalypse happened the dystopian future we'd all be dressed like mad max but here we are just wearing our bathrobes and like hoarding toilet paper or something. Uh, but I, I could definitely see where, why they, why they uh, developed this further. And, and you really point this out, um, Robert, if, if you haven't seen um, road warrior in a while, just the first five minutes, it basically takes this entire first movie and then places it into context in the greater world. Apparently there was a nuclear um, conflict and there was fallout and a whole bunch of um, of uh, promises by politicians that were falling through. And then you're kind of left with this world, this dystopian future. But it definitely felt like an afterthought that they didn't have that in mind when they made this first movie. It was only when this first movie did well that they did a second movie and they tried to like shoehorn in this greater narrative. That makes more sense to me. 
Yeah. It's also worth pointing out that Mad Max is always the the go-to point for anybody who advocates for anarchy. <laughs> right. Oh. Because the anarchy is all about right. violence, you know? Yeah. Flame throw guitars. Flame, don't forget the flame throw guitars there. Isn't that why we're anarchists? I mean, yeah, are you, guys here for, are you guys here for a different reason? And that, that was my reason. So, if you're right, I'm like, that's it, that's, that's my what life, that's what I want. Yeah. Why don't I have it yet? So I'm gonna Shaheen, make it come through. Shaheen, you, you were in a similar boat where you had only seen Fury Road until we decided to do this, mm -hmm. and then you watched all of these movies. Did you find that's that? Correct. You had an awareness of sort of what to expect, or or had an yeah, yeah. Went into it. I mean, I mean, there's references to Mad Max stuff in, in everywhere in popular culture. Like there was a Rick and Morty episode, I think, but they had like a Thunderdome and stuff. You guys, have you guys seen that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good episode. Yeah, so like it, it's everywhere, and like even like Batman v Superman had a scene like in the dystopian future. Everyone was calling out the Mad Max scene. Do you remember that? So Batman mm -hmm. with the trench coat. Where he's got the gun. Or, yeah. He's, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. it's, yep. it's, it's very, it's the cultural go-to for post-apocalyptic. What I did notice, I mean, if, if I had seen to point one thing out, that Google description, that ruins the whole movie when it says the wife and kid were murdered because they got murdered like at the beginning of Act 3 or the end of Act 2. It was like towards the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah. there's like so, 15 minutes left. once. Yeah, the exactly. So, so when you say that, it kind of just ruins the whole movie. But yeah, I did feel the tension in the first one. The first one felt more to me like it was a very kind of realistic approach. It's like, what if like, everything goes to shit, but people are still living in the cities. It, there was still green everywhere. It wasn't really deserty as much. And if it was, it was still like regular roads. But as the series went on, it got progressively more and more apocalyptic. Like the first one was kind of normal-ish, but like run down. You had this crazy biker gang who someone killed their friend and I guess they're just power hungry maniacs with no other reason. So they just go crazy and start attacking everyone. Um, then two, it was the oil rig place in the middle of nowhere. And it was all like, there was no green in two. I think it, the way I see it, there are some places that are still kind of like cities and towns and stuff that are not completely run down. But the more you travel, there's lots of places that, are run down and full just full of deserts and that's uh, so that's kind of just what you see throughout the movies because then in then he goes into the road warrior he goes to that there's a big rig and there's those hippie white dressing people who uh is that right is that well, that was two right yeah yeah and they're yeah. they're trying to get two thousand miles away because they heard that there's some like fertile land or something nice really far yeah. away and they're being harassed by that gang uh, with um, That's right. the big bald guy. The boom... And then there's the boomerang kid. Oh, it's humongous. That's right, yeah. yeah <laughs> humongous <yeah>. what? <laughs> uh, sorry. Humongous. That's an old joke. It's an old joke. That's a good one, though. Yeah, I know. I love it. Humongous. And then, yeah, so so basically you had the first one that was kind of like not made to to be the first movie in a series but then because it was successful then they made the second one which i think was actually pretty good though it's a little bit confusing like when we were watching it uh we saw the um the bad guys like doing all these stunts and going around this area mad max is up on this ridge looking down and we're like okay so are they training is this them yeah training? that's, then go that's kind of what i thought as well i didn't realize there were two different factions at war i just thought they were just messing around yeah. It was only later on that I discovered they were attacking to get the oil. And there was a, the people inside and people outside. I just thought it was a big, like, I don't know, like just a complex of people hanging around. Didn't realize there was something inside, a different faction outside trying to infiltrate. Right, right. Because the view is like some, from so far away. And I get it that yeah. it's like vantage point and whatnot. Um, mm. And then the third one is sort of like the Jedi version where there's like the Ewoks with those kids and they're all speaking. Mm you know broken english tomorrow tomorrow land yeah right and and then they end up uh going to uh sydney right and it's totally been run yeah. down and, and whatever but they think he's some kind of like savior some pilot uh who yeah. apparently crashed a plane and and um left some some kind of artifacts for them but that, that and then it's got tina turner and it's like super weird 
So yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these movies. Like the, the apocalypse just starts going higher and higher each movie. It just gets more and more apocalyptic. Like I think right. two and three were the sweet spot, in my opinion. And I like I like all all of them, but I think two and three were just that's where where it was, at. especially two. Okay, and then, well, I, I I agree with Robert. I think Fury Road is uh, is a far better like film. It looks beautiful. It has a coherent better production story. value. Yeah, and and, and it it uh, has a coherent story, but it's also like different enough than these other three that you can tell that they introduced new kind of concepts or borrowed some kernels of concepts from various parts of the first movie. Like in the very mm -hmm. first one, Mad Max, you've got Knight Rider who's stolen a vehicle and he's trying to get away from the police, and he's like. Like, look at me, toe cutter. Look at me. I'm driving fast. Look at me. Ah, he's a witness. Yep. Right. And and I think that was what they used in Fury Road for the witness stuff. And Absolutely. the you know, the being super like psyched up and and uh almost uh in this cult of personality of, of their leader. And toe cutter is um is the main guy in uh, Fury Road. Yes, yeah. and Morton Joe and Toe Cutter are the same actor, yeah. Right, and then, and then he nice died. Comic. He died a couple of years ago now, but um, he he died a few months ago, like in twenty twenty. I'm pretty sure. Oh, that oh, recent. Really? Wow. Mm. Yeah. So well, um, hat off to him. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Immortan Joe. Immortan Joe slash Turkana. Witness. Whatever he identifies as. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he might he might like one of them more than the other. He had more to do in Fury Road. I, there was so little dialogue in Mad Max, and very little of it was very, you know, meaningful. If you if you if you go back and watch the very end, and he's what was it, Charlie Kid Charlie or something like that? The the last guy, he, the guy he handcuffs to the the truck. Yeah, that, that's the that thing. Mm -hmm. it, it it so feels like. Charlie's just improvising his lines the whole time. It really is just like, and I, I, I seriously believe that very, very little was written. And I'm not even, it's, it, you know, if you got a bunch of talented or even young actors and you just give them the, the feel and the vibe and you explain who they are and their characters, you can just, you know, roll camera and, you know, this is what needs to happen in the scene. And how would you react? What would your character do? What would they say? You know, uh, if, if you're dealing with talented enough people, it can work. Yeah. You know, I, I found the, the first one to be pretty confusing. Um, like you basically have Max, who's a cop. And he's like this badass. But he somehow thinks that maybe he's like too good at it or getting to do it too much so he like is starting to like it so he's maybe becoming one of the bad guys and then his partner goose who's like he's actually pretty funny in this one um he gets attacked and and mutilated so he's like a little bit pissed off there and then this gang wants to go after max and so they sort of threaten him and they say we know who you are we know who you are which makes you think that they're threatening his family but then when they when the biker gang encounters his family it seems totally random and they encounter them multiple times, seemingly at random. It's not as if they're being stalked by this gang. It's just they happen to run into each other in the Australian wilderness for some unknown reason. And it's almost like a horror movie trope, like you were saying, Robert, where they just keep encountering each other and then trying to get away from each other. And there's like this sort of bit of a chase scene and they keep doing all the wrong things. Um, this is the half-baked script aspects. I think you're absolutely right. I think... You had uh, all the ingredients to, you know, for the, the gang to be really pissed off and for them to be complete psychopaths and for them to have enough of them so that they are stalking these people and finding out who they are. But you're right. She, she just randomly decides she wants to get her kids some ice cream. So they go over to their, basically their hangout where they're hanging out on the beach. And it's just a stroke of bad luck that she runs into them. I mean, if they didn't decide to get ice cream, then that scene doesn't happen and they live happily ever after. I mean, what, what is this movie hinging on? The kid's desire for ice cream? That's just not a compelling plot motivation point. You know what I'm saying? Right, or, or her wanting to go to the beach, like that that other time where she goes down and she's got to go like through this like 
miles of trail to get down there. She leaves her kid just randomly, like with Max by the car. They don't even know where the kid is. Yep. Just yeah, it's everybody spread out. Nobody be armed, and uh, we'll get picked apart by a superior force. That's real smart. That's good right? strategy. And, and the old lady Genius. that you know that that scene where where they get attacked after she goes to the beach, and then there's the the big uh, lumbering um, dim-witted guy. Uh, yep. the, the granny or the auntie or whoever she is, she says she's going to call somebody. But Who then never showed up. Yeah, that doesn't do anything. So I'm yep. like, okay, why is that important? And then why does it, you know, nothing ever happen with that? And then she goes to shoot the um, escape with the with the mom and the kid. And she has one shot in her, in her barrel and, you know, tries to shoot the guys. And they just whiz by her and run over the wife and kid. And yeah. again, it's with a barrel that long, with a barrel that long, there's no excuse for missing that shot, especially the first shot where she shoots into that black barrel. Give me a break. I don't care. A bitch. Okay. Well, I do appreciate though that the that the the shooting grannies show up back up in Fury Road, though. I don't know if they're in I Columbia. noticed that as well. No, they're, yeah. they're not really. Mm. Although Mad Max 2 did have a fear Fury is a like character. You notice that there was this warrior woman. All oh, right, and I think she's actually in the second one titled Warrior Woman. In, in yeah, the... really. <laughs> okay. How fitting. Right. Yeah, yeah. and it, 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 in that movie, it's also like confusing because you don't know what's going on with the two uh, groups down below. It kind of looks like they're just playing around or, or doing like a de demolition derby or stunts or something mm -hmm. like practicing. Um, but then when when uh, you're introduced to this woman character who's like defending the place with him, it, it's almost like, oh, they have this opportunity to have this love interest thing happen. But they don't do that. Yeah, but nothing. Nothing happens. They don't. They barely even talk to each other. And then she just gets shot on top of the rig. And that's it. Right. Right. It kind of felt like like a wasted opportunity. I could have done so much for that. Yeah. So, Robert, do you think that mad max was the title of the movie when they were making it or did it become the title after they were done and they're like okay well now he's really pissed off because his his kid is is dead and his wife is like mutilated in the hospital because i, I kind of thought it was an afterthought i thought it was originally just called the road warrior and then it got turned into mad max when they wanted to have part two be called mad max the road warrior Okay. That's what I. Uh, that's uh, that's how I understand the titling. I don't know if Shaheen has the inside skinny on that. That's how I recall it being the case. Not really. I have no idea. Yeah, I'm in mean, Australia, but like in my ancient, ancient brain, remember how old I am. I remember going down to the video farm, and there being a VHS tape on the shelf, and it was just called The Road Warrior, and it wasn't Mad Max Two: The Road Warrior. So. Take that for what it's worth. But I think that's the case. Maybe someone did like a ripoff. They're like, oh shit, this is making money. Let's make our own version. The Road I Warrior. Hope so. I hope so. It's like it's like Mad Max One, except even lower budget. <laughs> did you like the um them showing the Hall of Justice like three times or four times? Just that mm. one like scene setter. Like, oh, now we're back at the Hall of Justice. And uh they kept using the same clip over and over and over again. I appreciate that it was called the Hall of Justice. It just reminded me of like the Justice League. That's cute. That's right. They run down, but still, still works. I don't know where. You know, it's like this ancient. It's like this old prison out in the middle of nowhere. But I don't know. Maybe they do things differently in post-apocalyptic Australia. I don't know. Yeah. Now there was the one. Um, scene there where they sort of had a almost a a show trial where they had arrested that charlie boy or billy boy or whatever his name was and then the da goes in there i, I think it's a da or it's whoever the whatever their justice system is based on and he's like no let him go because he's in the pocket of the motorcycle gang well and but they said that nobody showed up to to what to bear witness or to be like to be at one of the uh now what is the word you know what i mean 
or whatever, like whatever that is going to like charge them or be a witness against for the crime or whatever. Right. Somebody needs to press charges. Right. And nobody came and did that apparently or whatever. Right. And, yeah. and likely due to like intimidation. But then it also seemed like this guy was in their pocket. Yeah, I guess. Although I don't really, I mean, do you really think toe cutter is that sophisticated? <laughs> he just seems like a guy who rides around on his bike and randomly assaults anybody who strikes his fancy. I don't know. It's just, the he's, killed the witness. He I'm seems like a character. He seems like a character that would have been dealt with long ago. He doesn't seem like a character that would be alive during this movie. If, if he's just running around murdering and killing, people would have dealt with him a long time ago. Uh, it just seems to me that way. And that's a lot of a lot of the case with these, you know, anarchy warlord people that are just complete douchebags and assholes and have no redeeming features. Like, I don't know if you, re you remember, um, did we do uh, Apes, the Apes movies, the remakes? Did, yeah. Okay, so. Well, I don't know if we did remakes. We did the first one, the Heston. No, we didn't. So we didn't do any of the Weta ones with, you know, Caesar, the three Caesar movies. Mm, we may have no. referenced them or referred to them in the. In the okay. Movie. Well, in the third one, um, what's his name? Cheers, boy. Woody. Woody Harrelson is this kind of, they call him like the Colonel or something. And he's this psychotic military commander guy and he's the villain and whatever but he has like a motivation he has a reason for why he wants to kill the apes and he can be kind and charismatic and charming to his subordinates and the people that he works with he's not just some one note crazy psycho person that it just doesn't make sense for this character to even exist so i think he's I appreciate what George Miller is doing, but in obviously, you know, it's this is the the early his earliest work, and of course, it's going to be flawed. But and we can always compare like Terry Carter to Immortan Joe. It's very fitting that that they were played by the same guy, but like he's more sophisticated. He's like the leader. He controls the water. He has right. all these like the breeders, the women. So he's kind of like right. that's different. That's like Terry Carter with a lot more, I guess, power. And resources and and there's like a reason why people would follow him right he's got a yeah. huge family he the water. he's got yeah. money and power and he controls the water yeah 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 in 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 mad max the original it's like i can't i can it's guess like you can get a couple psychos. you could get some other psychos to follow you because you're running around being a hooligan and there's plenty of people that are lost and just want to fuck with the world but there's still people that would get a gun and shoot your ass yeah. for doing all that crap anyway because you know remember the scene where he's just driving by the the young couple in the red uh sports car thing i don't know the classic car mm -hmm. the red classic car and they're just like well i just want to kill these people or i want to rape these people or beat them up or whatever and beat up destroy their car just because just because they're there and i that's always the argument for, you know, against anarchy that people would just act like that. They would just act like random monsters. And when they know they themselves know no random monsters. I don't know any random monsters in my life. I guarantee Daniel doesn't. Shaheen, I don't think you do either. And if there are if there are any, there are people that will put them in check. And it's not just Mad Max that's going to do it. It's <laughs> Uh, half a million people that are going to put that person in check anyway. Right. So I have a, I have a couple more uh, critiques of the original Mad Max. Number one, Mad Max is apparently really skilled at something, though I don't think it's demonstrated really at any point in the film. Yeah, I would, I would agree. He just seems to be a guy with a shotgun. Like anybody I mean, with guess, a shotgun can do what he does. Yeah, I guess I guess you can say that, like his driving skills and overall just being an action guy, like he might be better than the others. I don't think he was really exceptional, like because he's played out to be some really exceptional, like big super badass. But he's like he's no, he's not that 
badass. He's kind of like a regular guy who's had some training. It's kind of tough, but like he's not a superhero or anything. That's kind of the vibe yeah. I get. Yeah, he's right. definitely not. Like Batman fucking... would fuck him up. Yeah, Batman would fuck him up. <laughs> Die Hard would fuck him up. Yeah, he's just a <laughs> regular guy that lost his family and a man with Went mad. nothing left has nothing left to lose and he's gonna go for it I mean, obviously he does have good skills i mean to survive the thunder dome and to go against all these guys time and time again all these psychos and still live and win but yeah not not very graceful he always gets bashed up and like almost killed throughout the movies Right. Well, I guess I mean more in the in the first movie where the the police captain is like, oh, you're my best driver. And, you know, he's like so impressive at being a cop. But I don't mm. see that demonstrated in the first one, really. Yeah, like, no, I have to I totally have to agree with you, mm. Daniel. That was a case of, I think, them not having the skills to show, not tell. That was them being like, but Mad Max, you're the best thing ever. You're the greatest. And then they don't actually show us that he's the greatest and the best because they just right. don't he's have done a little bit of driving him. around and, and he like <laughs> made one guy crash and, and die, the Knight Rider guy. But is that all it takes? Shit, That's all it takes. And you're, you're the best. I'll crash right. someone, I can be the best. Fuck yeah. <laughs> but then they uh, they also try to um I guess he's on the verge of wanting to quit, right? And that's sort of one mm. of the subplots. And so they they uh, underhandedly or or like off the books try to entice him to stay by giving him this supercar the interceptor yeah the interceptor and and um they, they make it seem like the guy just found all the parts to do it but they actually secretly financed it as a way to try to entice him to stay but then he doesn't really seem to do anything in particular with the interceptor that he couldn't have done with the car he had originally just run some people off a bridge the motorcycle yeah thing. other than that uh, they kind of made it seem like those motorcycles were just really, really fast. And he had to have that V8 power, that nitrous V8 power in order to catch up with them. But yeah, you're right. It didn't really seem like that car was that special. But again, I, I, I will apologize a little bit for them in that this is more of, hey, I got some rough ideas and we'll try and make a movie kind of work. And it's going to be have a whole lot of flaws, and then hopefully we'll be able to be successful, and then we'll make better movies later. Which they Which did. They did. Exactly. <laughs> Which they did. And it's still better than any movie I've ever made. Now um, I don't remember two and three. Do the corners count. <laughs> I don't remember two or three, but are the interceptor uh, featured um, a lot in those movies? In two. Yeah, but I think it crashes in two. Like almost immediately. Yeah. Oh. Pretty much. That's unfortunate. Then, yeah. like, he has to eat dog food while he's with this. Um, what was the guy's name? The helicopter guy. Oh, I forget his name, but yeah, he's. I, I think they call him the gyrocopter pilot. Yeah. Like, it was, it, was a, it was a bit weird that him and Mad Max developed some sort of friendship in two, but then in three, I mean, I thought that guy became the leader of that tribe, the White Cloth tribe, at the end of two. Right. But then in three, he's out that. there again. Yeah. And then in yeah. three, he's there again. And then he it's as if he doesn't recognize Mad Max. Like the way they talk. It's like, hey, you, uh, do you want to live or something like that? It's just, it felt like I was expecting him to, to recognize Max. But like, hey, it's you. But it just didn't feel like they did. Right. And I thought that actually would have worked a lot better than what they did because they have him rob Mad Max at the beginning with the airplane yeah. maneuvers, but not mm. knowing that it's him, not knowing that it's his buddy. And then when the, he's in Thunderdome and he's in that uh, barter town mm. where he can see who, you know, they can yeah. see each other. It's like they pretend they don't know I, each other. Yeah. I noticed that he did say one man or two men go in, one man go out. He was one of the first that started cheering. So maybe he was cheering so that Mad Max lives. Now maybe. in, um, yeah. in Fury Road, I think he can define Mad Max's entire character by just saying that he has a massive dogged determination to survive no matter what the odds are. And in Pretty two and three, is that similar or are there different mm -hmm. motivations, a different character in those movies? 
he he's a bit more selfish in that like he he keeps trying to get a deal for oil. Like in the second one, he was going to do that. And... Yeah, he just wanted to get refueled and and be on his way. And then uh, I forget what the circumstances are. I think maybe they get attacked and and uh, their leader gets injured, and then he agrees to drive the rig or something like that. And it ends up being a decoy to draw the 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 biker gang or humongous's gang uh, to attack the tanker so that the, the children can the buses can go away. Yeah. And the buses have all the fuel inside. And so the tanker's just full of sand or whatever. And then in the third one, it's got the Tina Turner thing playing it over the top with the, the Thunderdome uh, one man leaves action. They've got um, the midget on top of the, the hulking guy. And he's the like master the, blaster. the master blaster is like the leader that's of the right. underground. And there's this. Also, that, that's, that's also another trope, the one with having like a big, um, stupid guy controlled by a small midget on the back. Like even Mortal Kombat has a character like that. Like that even that's become like a trope. Everything from Mad Max kind of becomes a trope. The Thunderdome, the apocalyptic stuff, the cars, yeah. the sandy dunes. Yeah. yeah. Good. I love it. Very phenomenal. It's good. Yeah. I, you can't take it away from his ability to influence culture. That's that's one thing he's been incredibly successful at. It's almost like a steampunk um, thing, like where I don't know if there was other like um, this type of genre before where there's these dune buggy style like cars with spikes and shit on them. Or if that's become a thing because of because of George Miller and because of this. I think it became I think it became because of him. Especially from two onwards. I thought I don't think one as much. I think one kind of saw, but two and three were the ones that had the big uh, cultural impact. Because when you think post apocalyptic, one doesn't really seem like what comes to mind. Whereas two and three, like it's there's pretty much no green. It's all just sandy. It's all just uh, like a dark yellow. And then you have all the crazy people with wearing stupid shit. And I don't know. I always thought so the, the um, flame for it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh well. I was just I was just gonna say that um, you're talking about two and three and who what Mad Max is doing like I I guess you would call him like the reluctant hero in Fury Road yeah it's definitely like the hero in the first movie he doesn't want anything to do he really wants to leave right is that the, also the case in two and three he just wants to be done he wants to get out of here he doesn't want to like it's definitely the case in two but in three like he goes and he, like. He goes to the Tina Turner place, then because he wins the fight and reveals that he had a deal with the Tina Turner character, they kick him out. They tie him up to this horse and just let him go out to the desert. And he's found by this tribe of like kids who, like, who I don't know, they kind of just, they have this belief of this really mystical place that they can go to, which is also used in Fury Road because they believe in the green place. And the yeah. people from Fury believed in the Tomorrow Morrowland, I think. So like, and then some of the kids go back. Uh, you know, we're going back to Barter Town or wherever. And so here he said he just goes back to to save them. Okay, so it, it's kind of out of gratitude then, not necessarily. The it's more like, I think he, he he just wants to like he, when he sees the kids in danger, he just goes out to save them without a second thought, really. Okay, that's so kind that of, kind of that's kind of how character. Yeah, yeah, and in Thunderdome, he does have like some skills as being a fighter and he's got a comical amount of weapons. Like they have him turn in his weapons at the, mm. at the door. And he's just like piling firearm after firearm, blade after blade mm. on the counter. It's like a dozen. Good, He's learned time. good. He's watching his <laughs> previous movies where he's like, man, that one guy at the shotgun, they didn't mess with him. Um, yeah, who does he end up beating in the Thunderdome? Does he fight master blaster? Yeah. Just the blaster. Oh, Okay. Yeah, the Just big, guy. big it, guy. Yeah, it ends up being the guy from uh, the first Mad Max. Huh? The big dumb guy. Yeah, the big guy. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. So it's like a little bit of a callback to that first one. Um, yeah. You know, I have one one more comment on that first one. Um, when the gang goes into that town, it sort of sets the scene as if the townspeople are afraid of this gang and what they're going to do. And so there's 
as a viewer, there's this expectation that they're going to attack these townspeople and like destroy the town and all this stuff. But what ends up happening is they just sort of like get rowdy and get drunk with the townsfolk. Yeah, they ended up just kind of partying. And then yeah. they do some some doughies and then they do some wheelies and then they're like, all right. And then they're like, fuck this red car. And then, yeah, they're like, fuck this red car because they're trying to leave, I guess. I, I don't know. I just don't like it when yeah. people leave. I also get angry when people leave my parties. Like, fuck you, <laughs> yeah. I'm chasing no. you down. Fuck those assholes. We're, we're, yeah. we're riding them down. Yeah. <laughs> Did you also notice the, the, the guy in the red car? After, like, it was a scene where he was running away. Like, when Goose and Mad Max came down, it looked like his ass was really red. Did yeah, it did. That? It looked like it was either think, bloody or red somehow. Yeah, I think he got raped or something. Yeah, that's, oh, kind yeah. Of, that's the first thing that came to my mind. I'm like, oh no, turkey. Yeah, yeah, really. No, that was the that was the implication. Either they were raping him with an implement or their penises. But yeah, that's yeah. that was the that was the impl- implication yeah. I got. Yeah. Where does he get a, a HIV test in first apocalyptic Australia? Mm. You know, there is a, a subtlety to um, a similar thing in uh, in Road Warrior, because like the not the main bad guy, Humongous, but the, his like first lieutenant guy or whatever, like his right. Oh, yeah. He's got, a, he's got a buddy who's like riding on his same bike with him. Who's got and that's like, the one that gets boomeranged, right? Yeah, he gets boomeranged in the yeah. head. But they look like they're a couple. Yeah, I did notice that as well. Uh. Yeah. So anyway. The apocalypse okay. is tough. You, know, you gotta do you what gotta, you gotta yeah, do. Yeah, you gotta buddy up with somebody, man. You know, so I'm, yeah. I'm almost turning gay now. Like, let alone during an apocalypse. So like, that's <laughs> that's, that's so smart. Just smart survival yeah. skills, right there. Yeah, All run right. down red red cars. Mm-hmm. Break the guys. That's... I didn't get something though. Why did that Charlie boy stay back with the girl, just lying down? When everyone else had left. Yeah, that made no sense. Why was he just sitting there? Yeah. Just hanging I out. I kind of just thought, what the hell was that? Like, I, uh, I was part of the gang that uh, destroyed all the stuff. I'm just going to sit around and wait to get caught. Yeah, Charlie seemed to me like he was trying to join the gang or, or go through like the initiation process mm-hmm. in some way. And he wasn't as... Um, overtly violent but more like psychologically traumatized and uh deeply disturbed like he was actually scarier to me than than toe cutter and any of the other overtly uh and obviously violent gang members for sure but it seemed to me again like george miller had this idea that one of them was going to get caught so that you know you could have these other scenes happen where he's getting released and they're finding out who the cops are and that sort of thing. And they're like, well, how can we have this guy? Not? Um, I'll just have him sit around and hang out, I guess. It, it, Convenient. I, this is, this is like, yeah, this is, I think the stuff that could have been ironed out with a few more script revisions with helping out, getting help from other experienced screenwriters and storytellers. But, you know, they made this on a shoestring budget. They made it probably in a very short amount of time with a guy that probably mortgaged his house or whatever, you know, called in all kinds of favors just to get it made in the first place. So I do appreciate how much effort, it, it especially in the, that time, right? I mean, they didn't just have like a an iPhone 10 and they could just start filming with, right? You got to rent nice cameras and get dollies or at least mount cameras onto cars or vehicles or whatever. You got to get all that stuff. So kudos to them for uh, getting this thing done. Yeah. Agreed. Anyway. Agreed. So uh, any final points anyone wants to make before we get into a summary and review and scores and all that good business? Uh, just uh, how impressed I am with uh, Miller. You know, I don't know if he's really ever going to be the, the master storyteller that I kind of wish he would be like if he worked with a really, really good screenwriter and then just used his artistic action, you know, and kind of partnered up with somebody that would create like the ultimate movie for me. But for what it is and what it was trying to be, Fury Road was a benchmark for action 
adventure movies, even if the script was, you know, fairly simplistic. And uh, if Mad Max is what it took to launch that whole thing, then I'm a big fan of Mad Max. So. All right. Well, why don't you just drop a score on it? Because that's that's a pretty good summary right there. Okay. Well, the original Mad Max, uh, it's got a lot of flaws. It is obviously, it doesn't look great. Uh, the characters aren't given a whole lot to do. Um, the direction in this, the script, you know, is probably really, really lacking. But it's got a certain amount of charm and it's got a certain amount of tension. And I got to give it a positive score. I don't think it's great, but I would give it like a 6.5. Um, and then with two and three, I can't give scores to because I haven't seen them in forever. But they're probably somewhere in the middle between those and Fury Road, which, you know, I think I've already scored as I, I don't remember what I gave Fury Road. It was probably in or above is just being so phenomenal. So not that it's perfect either. I, I, I didn't like the the, uh, the the terribly cheesy 3D effects that that was like kind of the in vogue thing. And like there's a scene where there's this steering wheel or the guitar that comes flying at you or whatever uh, a little distracting and there are a few you know things i can nitpick about that movie but for the most part uh it it stomps it just curb stomps so many other action movies that i, I find hard to fault it too much so 6.5 and a nine Nine on that Fury Road. And we actually did Fury Road a couple of years ago, so I'll have that one on our show notes page as well. So there's going to be a plethora of uh, prior appearances from Shaheen, our guest tonight, and also our episode on Fury Road. So Shaheen, Nine our... interceptors. Nine interceptors. Six and, All right. six and a half interceptors. <laughs> so, uh, so Shaheen, what's your uh, summary and review and uh, your score? And, and since you watched all four movies recently, um, I guess you can get right. four scores and seven years ago. Hmm. Let me think. All right, the first one, very bare bones. Um, not really that apocalyptic. I still enjoyed watching it. I mean, at the beginning, it kind of took off a little bit slower. It was a little bit boring, but towards the end, it got really good, and I really did enjoy watching it. And I think Robert's uh, 6.5 is a good, good score. 6.57-ish, I'd say. With 2, The Road Warrior, it, I definitely enjoyed that one a lot. It, it just felt like when I sat down and watched it, it just just stuck i wasn't waiting for it to finish or go i was just enjoying every moment of it all the characters were great the the feral boomerang kid humongous um especially that, that that um the white cloth wearing tribe the leader there the warrior woman who's uh, appropriately dubbed warrior girl or whatever um and it's of course the gyrocopter guy so that was good i'd probably give two an eight and three um the three was pretty good as well. The Thunderdome, the whole Tina Turner thing. The tribe. I'll probably give three a seven point five. Kind of in between one and uh, two. And I'd probably have to give Fury Road an eight as well, on par with two. All right. So basically, black and golds, uh, pretty much all around. Recommend yeah, that, all four of the that, films. They were all enjoyable, at least to watch once. Yeah, it, and. I agree. It was good to have watched them. Um, I've only seen any of the first three movies like bits and pieces over the years. And so I had the more of the cultural phenomena of like being aware of it and from other references, you know? And so I guess I was expecting it to be a little bit better than it was. Mm -hmm. And so that's a bit of a letdown, though. I do think that the original and Road Warrior are both pretty decent, especially for what they were trying to do and what they spawned off. I did not like Thunderdome. I just it, it felt a little too hokey. It felt very much like the, those kids with the Ewoks and Tina Turner was like this over the top um, cameo type thing, like uh, Grace Jones in A View to a Kill, the James Bond movie with Roger Moore, which is like over the top. So I'm going to give that one a little bit of a lower score. And then we watched Fury Road again, and I enjoyed it. Um, it's, like Robert said, it's really well done action film. The story, while a bit simplistic, at least there's a coherent story, right? 
and uh i think it's you know it's still pretty good it doesn't need too much you know they they go out she's trying to like find this tribe and then thinks that she can go 160 days in the desert but then decides to turn back and go three days in the desert to go and uh take over the little you know area that um morton joe had um uh, and it has a lot of like flashes of um i i really like the the war boys and those characters and and just their like fervor and all that so i i, I really like three year old quite a bit so i'm gonna go with uh seven on the original 7.5 on road warrior go with a four on the old thunderdome and an eight and a half on the fury road those fair fair scores i think they're all probably worth watching at least once for for their cultural impact if nothing else probably but i highly recommend of course fear road uh and i should probably go back and watch road warrior you guys are kind of making yeah, it sound I, like I a watch time. Two. Two, is, two is really good yeah well, okay. once you kind of figure out what's going on it's a bit confusing just because of how it's presented and I don't know if that's intentional. Maybe you're not supposed to get it right away, but uh, I felt I like... think movie making back then was just a little more confusing. They didn't really flesh things out as as well. They weren't that good at fleshing it. Yeah. Because a lot of movies from that time, like old movies, are kind of confusing when you watch them. They don't like flesh things out, or they don't like set the scene too well, and things kind of look all over the place until it makes sense of it later on. Yeah, so it's almost like. That? Yeah. Road Warrior is maybe better on a second viewing when you kind of have the overall gist of who's who and who's doing what to who. Because it's but in, in Road Warrior and in Thunderdome, he both does not have his family. They've both been killed, right? Yeah, yeah. No police force. No, no family. No, no, no. There's no mention of any of that. Just, just nothing. It's as if he. It's like Fury Road. How he's just a random guy on the just by himself in the desert. Yeah, though in Fury Road, I think he refers that that he was a cop. I think he mentions it to somebody. Mm. Yeah, and there are flashbacks to his family being killed and wanting, you know, him feeling guilt over not saving them and that sort of thing. But yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the other thing with Fury Road that I didn't get is is those flashbacks that he's haunted by. Like you didn't save us, you didn't save us. But in watching the first three films, the only people he didn't save was his wife and kid, and I guess Goose, his partner. But like he saves almost all of the kids in uh, the Ewok Village one, except for the one kid who like falls into the um, the sand the sand, sand trap. Yeah, and so, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm not even sure if they're in the same continuity. Like, is Fury Road like a sequel to Thunderdome, or is it just like its own continuity? Is it like a new reboot? I always thought it was just a new thing. Yeah, it feels much like a reboot. Like, it, like he's just kind of like a George Lucas type where he's constantly just re-evolving the same idea. It seems to be. Okay. So it's not that he's haunted by anyone we've met before per se. He's just I mean, a haunted guy. I mean, it could be, it could be that like it is a sequel and he's haunted by all the people that died like in two, like that tribe. And like that a lot could have happened between I don't know, three and Fury Road. If, if they are set in the same world, same continuity. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe I don't know. Multiverse. Multiverse. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. I don't know if the George Miller has officially come out and said that you know these are all a strict quadrilogy or anything like that. I don't know. Sure. Don't know. Well, you tell us, audience. Hit us up uh, on our socials and uh, leave us comments and all that stuff, or, or you know. Join us on the old Patreon, lastnerds.com says Patreon. You can leave comments on there as well as your dollars, your uh, Federal Reserve notes. We'd love to receive some of those while they still have buying power, uh, which probably won't be much longer with the trillions and trillions that they've printed in the last... Give uh, it a week. So. <laughs> Just wait two weeks. We'll see what happens. Hey. Um, so, Robert, while, while you're there, uh, could you remind people what other things they could do to support what we do on this here show? Yeah, there's all kinds of different ways uh, other than just, just living your life and being a free, sovereign individual and not uh, paying attention or caring what the mainstream media or uh, people have to say about you. Um, yeah, supporting us on Patreon is a great way to do it. It's a great way to give us your, like Daniel said, the massively devalued uh, Federal Reserve notes, but also to just interact 
and give us thumbs up. And I understand I'm a lurker too. I don't really go out and reach out, but um, when you get that feed, it's really powerful. You know, a lot of us in this kind of Liberty movement don't, we don't, we're not really doing it to get like any kind of monetary, you know, we're not looking to be, get rich off of doing this. We're looking this, to do this to, to help make a better world, to spread these ideas. And a lot of times, you know, our, our other lives, you know, get in the way and we don't have time to do this. So if we don't feel like we're getting any kind of feedback or traction, then maybe we're going to stop doing it. And I'm not talking about us specifically, but I know that other people in the, liber in the Liberty Movement have burnt out and, uh, you know, kind of come around left and then come back or just kind of disappeared. And, uh, you know, support what you want to see more of in the world. That's what I believe in. And I'm sure that's what you believe in, too. So if you want to see more content like this, you know, reach out, become a part of the show. We've had so many listeners come on to the show and they've been great guests. So, yeah, reach out. Talk to us about a, a movie that you think we haven't that we haven't done that you think would make great fodder, great discussion even if you don't want to come on and talk about it yourself, uh, recommend a movie to us. That'd be fantastic. We've had a lot of guests and people just send us random movies. Hey you guys, this is a, uh, saw this movie and it had so many interesting themes. We've done quite a few shows based on interesting, uh, listener recommendations. So that's really, really cool. So yeah, that's, that's all I had to say about that. I have spoken. This is the way. To, uh, it is the way. This is the way to do it. That's right. To the green place. To the green place. And this was our episode on Mad Max. I, of course, forgot to do our movie logo sound effect uh, early on in the episode. Yeah. But there it is. Chunk. No, that's like a big old chunk. Yeah, there we go. So, Shaheen, thanks again for, for being our guest on this one. It's hey, no worries. Happy As to always. be here. We'll have you back uh, for the old uh, Snyder Cut in a couple Snyder of months. Cut. And, Hell yeah. Uh, hopefully you can stick around for a little bit longer for the Patreon bonus content coming up right yeah. after these messages after we say good night from last night everyone. Peace out. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot. I neglected to say what we're doing oh, next no. week. Oh no. Next week we're going to be changing our tune entirely and we're going to welcome back our friend Miguel Duque who was on for Napoleon Dynamite and the Social Network. And he, by the way, has left almost all the uh, mainstream social networks. So that'll be an interesting point of discussion in the bonus content with him. But he wants to do La La Land, which, Robert, I think oh. you're a fan oh. of this movie. I, I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. It, um, you know, Hollywood loves movies about itself. And this movie is very much about Hollywood. Um, I'm a huge Emma Stone fan. And I think this is her best work in terms of her characterization. So yeah, the, the singing, not so good, but the, for the, the young director, I think he's like, he was like 30 or 31 or 32 or something like that. He's very young and he won the best director and all kinds of accolades and that sort of thing. I think he also wrote the script too. So, um, it's a, it's an impressive film. If it doesn't quite hit home for you. And I do think we'll come up with some criticisms, but overall, uh, it's definitely worth a watch. Okay. So well, I have, I have not seen it yet, but I will. And then uh, we'll okay. talk about it. All right. Next All week. right. Then maybe we will. Maybe we will. All right. Well there, now I can say, we'll see you guys next week and good night from last night, everyone. Peace out. All right, and we're going to continue the transmission for just a little bit longer on the Actual Anarchy podcast. Um, so usually I talk about like a, a, a question that's not so safe for the normies here, but this one's going to be a little bit more of a personal story, and it is a little bit related to this film franchise series. And it is that our power went out last week, and so I had the uh, free trial version of the Anne Prim Lifestyle 
of which Mad Max sort of represents, you know, like a lot of technology is destroyed. And as the series progresses, they have less and less uh, material wealth and material um, capacity for technology and, and creature comforts and things like that. And I got to say, being without power and trying to uh, do my job um, in little 10 minute spurts on a backup battery. Uh, and we were without power for two and a half days almost. Uh, it sucks, man. I love electricity. I love gasoline, man. I uh, I am not one to um, wish the Ann Prim lifestyle on anyone. And I am so f happy and fortunate that we live in this generation rather than five or six generations ago when electricity was not a thing. I mean, not even the Anprims really live Anprim lifestyles. I don't see many of them actually going out, like living in a hut, like mud huts or whatever. So I think they're, they're all a bunch of hypocrites, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know of an Anprim. I know, I know that it, the, the philosophy exists, but I have yet to meet one, interact with one. Maybe that's because they are living in mud huts. I yeah, don't know. I don't that, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, what notable figures do they have? Like the Unabomber or something? Is, is, mm. That's about it, isn't it? Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, we were, I mean, there are. I live out in the sticks, and there are people who... They're just harmless. Well, there are people that live in... They live off-grid, but it's because they don't have electricity, they don't have running water, and they go down they drive their trucks down to the bottom of the hill at the bottom of the mountain they go to the cistern they fill up their trucks with water they drive back up to the house and that's how they live but well, that uh, raises another question like how much technology would be allowed for an amprim so wouldn't some say that just having the truck in the first place is too much like i would think so yeah because like at well, what point does it tool, become amprim? right yeah i mean yeah or like what's walking. allowed and like thinking mm. that that's a tool, that's the first tool that to mind, mm. or you're not allowed to use your mind because oh, there you go. If you want to just clothing. strip it down to like its core, clothing, hunting. Yeah, I I really I don't think that the philosophy is actually coherent. It's not sound. You have to like pick an arbitrary place. Like okay, it's okay to have this amount of tech, but not anything further. Right. Yeah. Well, it's what's even like the motivation? I, yeah, what is the, the, what's the allure? I mean, I understand some of the allure that people get a little bit too overwhelmed with a rat race and mm. get frustrated with technology. And but so there case, is a desire to go back to the land, but. They're very welcome to do that without like, cause their philosophy kind of forces them on everyone else. It's kind of like we live as an emperor society. Whereas like, if they look at them, they're free to go somewhere in the middle of nowhere, some wasteland and their housing's cheap. And just live there, there. There is that. Um, where is that? Do you know what that called? It's like Freedom Town or Freedomville or something. It's that communist uh, city that's. You know what I'm talking about, Daniel? It's like around Los Angeles or Las Vegas or something. I think it's in California. You know what I'm talking about? No. Of course, it's California. It's like, oh, gosh, what is it called? But it's basically a bunch of hippies. That uh, just kind I, of I squatting. You're, you're not talking about. I know what you're talking. About. They have like all these like rundown cars, and that's kind of like. Yep. Yeah. yeah there's all cool. kinds of artwork, but it's all made mm -hmm. out of junk and stuff, and yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. I know exactly mm -hmm. what you mean. Yeah. But who would want to live like that? Not very many people. <laughs> I mean, with good reason. I mean, the rat race sucks, but people do it for a reason. And if they want, then they can. I guess if they really hate it, then they can just become entrepreneurs or find. A different line of work. It's just, well, and technology it's very is allowing for a lot of people. And technology is allowing more and more opportunities. Like, how many people are finding work from home yeah. through a, yeah. a high speed internet connection? It's I would, I'm looking at one right now. Looking at that one, that guy. Right. Looking right at right me. there. Look, yeah, and that, that's the other thing. Like, if 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 you're overwhelmed because of uh, technology, but all this technology is actually making having the you know standard of living like come to you far easier. Like if you had to drive down and fill up your cistern and not have electricity and not have running water. And That's more overwhelming, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. Like think of all the the labor that you would have to employ of your own self 
to have the food and have water and and clean and you know all the things that you would take for granted and that that's another thing like having the power go out it it did give a lesson for the kids to like not take this for granted you know so now they're very careful about like turning the lights off and like no we don't want to you know spend too much money on on the electricity and, and also to be able and also they should be able to they should learn to enjoy uh, things that don't require electricity like books i don't know board games is that still a thing yeah. activities yeah. sports yeah. playing shit like that yeah, we've been mm-hmm. reading like crazy, and uh, we got a this uh, card game called Rat Attack Cat. Okay, and it's Rat-a-tack. great. Still rocking that game, huh? Right on, right on. Oh yeah, yeah. It was a gift uh, from some some of our friends who visited uh, a couple of months ago, and we played it. I don't know, dozens and dozens of times, and uh, it's got replay value. It's got some some skill involved, a lot of luck involved, a uh, little bit of nuance. You can sort of like figure things out that uh, make tiny little advantages in your favor. They don't always pay off, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting mm-hmm. game. It's a lot of fun. It's like 10 bucks on Amazon. So if uh, people want to have a, a game, the card game, they can play with kids uh, as young as four or five years old. Check it out. It's called Rat Attack Cat. I'll put a link. Now, to while you were, while you were living the end frame lifestyle, did you fire up the interceptor and go get fuel, get some gasoline from your neighbors? I did, did you run down the red car. Well, see, and that's another thing. And then we should probably get into some Kathleen Turner overdrive right for this. But uh, it, it was a nice thing because we got to test our preparedness. Like mm. we have all these like backup batteries and like lanterns and flashlights and, and um, you know, batteries. We had to like make sure that we could find everything and, and get it all in working order. And for the most part, like things were where we needed them to be and, and did what we needed them to do. And when the, uh, pandemic started we actually got a generator we'd been thinking about getting one for years uh and that finally pushed us over the edge to get one and i had not fired it up um and uh our freezer and our fridge were starting to thaw out and we have you know we load that thing up right like i I don't like to go to town more than once a month to go and get supplies and whatnot and so we were at risk of losing all that stuff in there so we've figured out how to fire this thing up. And, and that was actually a good exercise. You know, like that's one lesson I took from this is it's not just enough to have these things, but you need to have a working knowledge of how to get them to work and maintain them and sort of a strategy on how to implement them and when to implement them and, and how to stage them so that you can access them at the times you would need them, things like that. And so it, it kind of gave us that dry run. And, and so we're, we're making a couple of adjustments on our end, but I think it, uh, it was worthwhile and beneficial. All right. So you found some silver lining to that. Did you, how did you end up preparing your meals? Were you using the stove? Are you, you cooking it in the outside in a campfire can, or what? Can, maybe canned dog food, like <laughs> yeah. mm, canned dog food. Mm. That, that's where it's at. Yeah. We, uh, we fired up the barbecue and we heated up things on the barbecue, uh, including water to make instant coffee and hot mm. dogs for the kids and things like that. And then we've also got these little fire pits thing, fire pit things, and so you can um, skewer things uh, like s'mores and uh, cheese dogs, chili cheese dogs, things like that. Oh, okay. oh, living the high life. All right. That's right. That's right. Well, hey, speaking of the high life, uh, we're going to be living it up next week with Miguel Duque in the La La Land. And uh, looking forward to that. I haven't seen it, but I'll be watching in the next couple of days. And Shaheen, thanks again for, for coming on. Hope you can stick around for a little bit longer. Yeah, and we'll be back here in April for the Snyder Cut. So I Yeah, that's baby. Our, that's our episode, babies. Uh, check us out, actuallyanarchy.com slash 217 for show notes and more. And we'll see you guys all next week. Maximum freedom. Peace out. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do